All right. Uh, reminder uh, of things that are coming your way. Reminders, plural. Uh, homework three is uh, on Canvas and it's due in one week. This is a set of uh, multiple choice set questions. And uh, for almost all questions, more than one answer may be right. And there was an excellent explanation on how Canvas does grading of this in the homework thread. Uh, please take a look. And in fact, I learned how it works from that thread. Um, you'll have two attempts and uh, the higher one will be taken. At the end of the first attempt, you should be able to see which questions you got wrong. Um, some of you have already started. Are there any questions about the homework? Uh, the way I'm, uh, I've structured the homework is it's supposed to be like a, a sort of a, a way to kind of look back at all the stuff we've done this semester. Um, in some sense, you can also think of it as a way for you to revisit all the material as you're preparing for your midterm. Yes. At least M. So the uh, the label is one if at least M out of the chosen N features are true. Other yes. Uh -huh. Oh, good question. So the question was: uh, There's a the, the, uh, one of the homework questions talks about least mean square uh, regression, and is that in general about least mean square regression or about specifically the linear regression that we saw in class? For now, let's assume it's linear regression. But uh, that's an excellent comment because least mean square regression, the idea can be used for nonlinear uh, classifiers as well. Other comments or questions? Since I already mentioned it, uh, no harm in reminding you again. There's going to be a midterm in class next Thursday. Uh, so you'll have essentially as long as the class one hour and 20 minutes or something. Um, and uh, this will cover everything that we would have done by this Thursday. So including uh, computational learning theory and pack learning, which we'll talk about today, and a bit of Occam's razor, uh, possibly all of it, uh, assuming we'll finish that on Thursday. <clears throat> but since you've, you've not encountered a homework yet with that material, I will not be asking you to prove things about what you've not already kind of played with. Uh, but, you know, I might be asking you things about, you know, what it is and such questions. Yeah. There's no Zoom option. For there's, for there's no what option? No Zoom option. Oh, God, no. No, no, no. There is no Zoom option. It's going to be in person. Uh, I The idea of proctoring on Zoom is so distasteful to me. Uh, so no, uh, there is no Zoom option. I, I don't know what that means. Let's just say I don't want to watch you writing uh, uh, a midterm over Zoom for one and a half hours. That's the most boring movie ever. Um, so no, yeah. I mean, can you add? It will probably quit. It will strike. <laughs> Um, is there going to be a faculty camp or something that will show us like the depth of questions we can expect? Or uh, I'll think about it. Usually, uh, what I do as a matter of convenience and policy is I don't give a practice exam and I ask you to think of homework three as a practice for half of the uh, about about half of the midterm because half of the midterm will look like homework three. Um, the reason I don't usually give practice exams is because if I give you a practice exam, it's basically a list of questions that's guaranteed not to show up in your midterm. Um, on the other hand, I see your point. I mean, it kind of gives a sense of what types of questions you can expect. Um, I'll think about it and I'll let you know Thursday. Yes. No, uh, it's closed book, closed notes, uh, phone, laptop, etc. Yes, nothing. Other questions? And you know, I, I, I recognize that having a closed book exam also means 
it might seem like I'm asking you to memorize a whole bunch of stuff. Um, I'm going to try to make it so that you don't have to memorize too much. Uh, that doesn't mean you don't have to know too much. You just don't have to memorize complicated uh, things like what is the log of five to 18 digits. Don't worry about that. You don't need that. Um, that was a bad joke. I'll not make it again. Um, but uh, uh, in general, I won't ask you to memorize complicated formulas. Uh, because that's really not what the point is. There's a question on, uh, could we be asked to develop an algorithm such as con or having for any given concept class in the midterm? Um, maybe. Uh, I don't know yet because I've not made the midterm yet, but the, uh, I would not rule it out. But of course, I also recognize that you have only an hour and 20 minutes. So I'm not going to ask you to invent something that's going to be like a publishable uh, thing that you might write a paper about. So I will, try, I, I will try my best to keep it reasonable. Of course, at the end of the midterm, you might disagree with our definition of the word reasonable, but uh, it will be somewhat reasonable. But uh, even if, it, if I ask you to invent a new algorithm, it won't be something tedious. Other questions? I don't have any other announcements. And uh, uh, if there are no questions about the homework or the midterm, there is a question about one of those. Um, is there going to be a review for this next Tuesday? Oh, there is, is there going to be a review for uh, for what? For the midterm. Depends on how much we complete. If we finish everything till Occam's razor by Thursday, then there might be a review. If not, I will keep charging forward. And most likely we will. So there's going to be, I'll try to devote at least half of next Tuesday's lecture to a review. All right. Um, there are no questions. I'm going to. Go ahead and talk about uh, uh, continue where we left off on computational learning theory. Uh, in the last lecture, we looked at uh, just a high level introduction to what a theory of learning might look like or what it might entail. Uh, and in particular, I presented this uh, idea that in what we want, what we're looking for is some sort of a, a theoretical framework that justifies when learning would succeed if you have a certain by by uh, by uh, involving factors such as the number of training examples the degree of accuracy that we desire the certainty that we believe we hope learning will succeed the size of the concept class and such things uh, in today's lecture i'm going to formalize that a bit more one other thing that we saw in the last lecture was uh, uh, we did this part. One other thing that we saw in the last lecture was a concrete definition of the notion of the error of a hypothesis. In order to define the error of a hypothesis, we, uh, uh, we assume, we had to make an assumption that all examples in your training set and in the future are sampled IID from a fixed but perhaps unknown distribution that I'm calling D. D is a distribution over training examples. And your entire training data is repeatedly asking this sampling examples from this distribution. And the reason there is a hope for any sort of a theory is because the future examples are going to be sampled from the same distribution, that that's the assumption we've made. Because of that assumption, extremely rare uh, examples or Im impossible examples will not show up at test time. Which means your training data and your test data may, are not going to be the same examples, but they will look similar. As a result, there's hope for generalization. The other uh, reason for uh, introducing this assumption that, that uh, there's a fixed but unknown distribution is that it, it allows us to define the notion of a training error and actually the generalization error or the true error, which I call error D of a hypothesis. 
error B of a hypothesis, the generalization error or the true error of a hypothesis is simply the probability that that hypothesis disagrees with the ground truth on a randomly sampled example from this distribution. So you pick an example, X, from this distribution, sample it from this distribution, and ask what's the probability that H of X is not equal to F of X. This is an event that's either true or false, and we are asking what's the probability that this uh, event is true. Ideally, if this is a rare, uh, if this is a low prob probable event, then our classifier is good because on examples that we might realistically expect to see, namely examples sampled from this distribution, uh, the, the hypothesis that we've learned and the ground truth, the oracle function, are not going to disagree too much. It's improbable that these two disagree. That's the hope. Um, so that th th this is a formal definition of the error of a hypothesis. Uh, and we're going to build the rest of our theory of generalization using this definition. Any questions with where we left things off? Seem to be no questions on Zoom also. So let's now move to uh, this uh, definition of something called probably approximately correct learning or PAC learning. It's a fantastic name. Um, in this section, I want to define this PAC model of learning and then uh, make connections between the idea of learnability and the philosophical concept of uh, Occam's razor which some of you may have encountered uh, in other contexts, at least in casual conversation. Well, we're going to have a theorem called Occam's razor. At least we'll have a couple of theorems that are all called Occam's razor, which come out of this pack assumption. Let's uh, start off with uh, just a definition. Just like with the mistake bond model of learning, I'm going to define the pack model of learning. What that means is I'm going to define a set of concept class is learnable if certain properties hold. Doesn't mean that that property ever holds for anything. And then we'll see whether those properties hold for which concept classes and so on. So let's get going. Um, one slide, uh, just to kind of remind you of where we are. We are dealing with uh, instances X that come from an instance space, which is just a set of all possible examples, capital X. There is a concept space, capital C, which is a set of functions that we believe nature uses to choose its true function from. It's just a, it's just this hypothetical uh, uh, set that we don't have access to. Out of that set, nature chooses a particular function that we call the concept or the target function f. And this might look like, uh, you know, the set of all conjunctions of a certain size or linear classifiers or neural networks of a certain shape or any set of functions that we believe nature uses to choose its true uh, target, uh, true function is called the concept class. Our goal is to find a good approximation for the concept class F, concept F, using this set of, another set of functions called the hypothesis space or the hypothesis class. The set of hypothesis class is a set of all functions that our learning algorithm explores in order to uh, find a good approximation. And we'll use the letter little h to denote hypothesis. In order to find this hypothesis, to help our learner, we are going to give it a, a training set. A training set consists of a finite sample of the, of the instance space, meaning essentially a set of instances sampled from capital X. For each such sample, we'll apply the, or the true function F to get a pair, an example and a label. We'll do that many, many times. And that gives us a, a, a training set. The finite subset of the instance space, I'm going to call it capital S. In order to sample this example, the, the, the training set, I could, uh, you know, I could sample it uniformly, which means that every element of the instance space is equally likely to show up in my training data. Or I could let nature decide to sample it for me. Certain instances are more likely to show up in nature than others. If you want an example of that, the thing that we discussed uh, in the last lecture is 
certain documents, certain sequences of words are more likely to be valid English than certain other sequences of words. So they are more likely to show up in documents. Certain collections of pixels represent meaningful things and we call them photographs. Certain other collections of pixels look like random noise and they are less interest to us. There exist noisy images which are which may have low probability and so on. So there is a distribution, capital D, over the instance space, and that's the distribution that we are going to sample the instances from. Our goal is to find this hypothesis, little h, from the set of uh, hypothesis functions, such that h of x and f of x agree. Now, you know, in order to measure this notion of agreement between our hypothesis and the target function, we will evaluate whether they agree on future examples, on examples that are not part of the training set, but you may call it the test set, the evaluation set. So there is a set of examples that the hypothesis is going to be evaluated on. And this set is also going to be drawn from the same distribution. The uh, distribution the D, which importantly, is both fixed, meaning D is not changing between the training and the test time. And we don't, we're not making any assumptions about whether we know it or not. In fact, we're going to build our theory assuming that D is unknown. If we know D, maybe we could do better, but we are assuming that D is unknown. All we need is that it's not going to change. So this is the set of all uh, uh, symbols that we have encountered so far. Um, I just went through the entire list till here. There are two kinds of errors of interest. There's the true error of the hypothesis, which is simply the probability that the hypothesis makes a mistake on a randomly sampled example. And then there is the training error or the empirical error. The empirical error is simply the fraction of the training set that the hypothesis gets wrong. We can compute the empirical error, but we would like to optimize for the training error. Sorry, we would like to optimize for the, the, uh, the true error. Sometimes this is also called the generalization error. Any questions about this? We've covered all of this in the last lecture, but I just wanted to uh, quickly give you a, a list of all the symbols that we've encountered and that we will be playing with going ahead. Any questions about the setup? Any questions about the, the assumptions that we have here? There's an important assumption that we are making that the future will look like the past as far as, of our, as far as our instances are concerned. This assumption does not always have to hold because you know, documents change, images change, uh, and uh, it's going to be an assumption that is broken often, but in practice, uh, there are ways to get around it because there are like, extensions of this theory that uh, allow for changing distribution. However, this idea that uh, our classifier might be tested on examples that are improbable during training, meaning the distribution has changed from training to test, is still an open uh, research question. Sometimes we look at, we, in research papers, we look at it as uh, out of generalization, out of distribution generalization. What that means is the we want to generalize to distributions that were not seen during the training set. For that, we have to make other kinds of assumptions because how could we possibly know uh, what the label would be for an instance that never ever shows up? And not only did that instance not show up, nothing like that ever showed up. So you typically have to make some assumptions. But for now, we'll be working with this somewhat more um, closed setup. What do we want from any theory of generalization? What, one question that's of immediate interest is, can we say something about the generalization error if we know the training error? The training error is something we can compute. If you have a classifier, you literally enumerate, do, write a for loop over the entire training set. For every training example, you count whether the training, uh, the, the your classifier got the true label or not. 
And if it did not, you increment a counter and you divide that count, divide by the, by the number of examples, that gives you the fraction of errors. That is the empiric, empirical error. It's easy to compute it, but that's not something we care about. It's, it's trivial to get an empirical error of zero. Here's a classifier that is guaranteed to get a training error of zero. What I do is I take the entire data and put it in a database, in a table. And at test time, when an example comes up, I see if it show if it is in my table, if it's in my table, I give the label. If not, I just return a random label. So for every example in the training set, of course, this table classifier, which is really lousy, will do perfectly well because it's just memorizing the entire data. However, its performance on new examples will be as good as chance because I'm randomly uh, picking a label. So it's easy to get zero training error. For any hypothesis, I can get compute the training error. What I care about is can I say something about the true error given that my training error is such and such? Yes. Uh, so there is a conjecture in that, no, you can't. And uh, maybe by the end of today, or maybe by the end of uh, Thursday, I hope to convince you that at least in certain circumstances, the answer is yes. In the limit, it turns out the answer is no. This is assuming that the error That's right. That's right. It's assuming that we're randomly selecting the generalization the exam, the test example from the same distributor, always. The other, if we could do that, if we can describe the training error, can we say something about whether a certain concept class is learnable or not? Now that's a little bit vague uh, because the idea of learning is inherently the sort of a biological function. What does it mean for some, concept to be learnable. Can we say something about whether it can be learnable or not? In order to kind of formalize that, we need to introduce certain computational notions. More, even more interestingly, can we learn a certain concept class, whatever learn means, can we learn a certain concept class, C, but use a different set H to uh, get a best approximation? So for example, if your true concept class was the set of all possible decision trees of depth 15. And that is what nature has used uh, to label a data set. And my learner is now exploring the set of linear classifiers to find a good approximation of whatever decision tree nature used. Question is, is that even possible? If it is possible, how bad uh, could it be? Or how good could it be? And the more uh, sort of uh, interesting question is, uh, another interesting question is how many examples do we need in order to guarantee that a certain concept class, no matter which function is chosen, a certain concept class can be learned. Um, and what does can be learned mean? It means we get good performance or good enough performance. All of these questions essentially are the basis of computational learning theory. And we'll be looking at, uh, specific answers to many of these, so to these questions, the answers that we look at are in some sense, literally the first step. If you're interested in these sorts of answers, I can point you to entire books that discuss this in great detail. And it's a interesting uh, uh, line of research with many open questions that uh, if you feel excited about it, you should pursue. Let's, before we even think about whether certain concept classes are learnable or whether uh, we can, how many examples are needed to learn, uh, for us to learn. Let's kind of think about what we expect from a learner. Now, rather than saying what we expect about from a learner, I'm going to describe what we cannot, should not expect from any learning algorithm. We cannot expect a learner to learn the concept exactly because you, you, you're only given a finite training set. Given only a finite training set, how could you possibly, ex there might be many, many different functions that agree with the true concept, with, the, with that data set perfectly. Nature 
has probably used one of those many functions in its mind. How could I pick between them? How do I know without any assumption which function nature has used? It's, it's entirely possible that uh, the, the, the function that I pick and the function that nature picks both agree on a training set but are not identical. So we should not expect a learner to learn the concept exactly. Um, the, the, re, the side effect of that point is that because nature and I might have chosen different functions that all agree on the training data, a future example might have different labels. Maybe my function and nature's function disagree with each other on a future example. So on that example, maybe I'll just agree that uh, it's okay if I make a mistake on that example. Because what can I do? I have no information to help me disambiguate between these two functions, which are identical as far as the training data are concerned. So let me just uh, be willing to make those errors where I have no information. This is, uh, in some sense, a very, I gave you a technical description of a very easy point. No matter where uh, you see, a, you encounter any sort of learning, um, human or machine, there's no guarantee that the learner is going to pick up the concept exactly. There is no guarantee and there's no, there should be no expectation of that. There's always room for error because there might be genuine ambiguity. Questions about this uh, point before we move on? Yep. Cool. Is there ever are, are training sets ever like select or are they always randomly chosen from certain systems? Um, so the question was are training sets ever selected or are they randomly chosen from the set of examples? For today, for this part of the lecture, we'll assume that they are randomly chosen. Um, there are Interesting extensions, interesting uh, instantiations of ideas where training sets are selected. One instance, for example, is active learning, where the learner chooses the, the examples to label and thereby constructs a training set based on its uncertainty. That's one example. Another example for a training set being um, constructed is the idea of a curriculum. Um, uh, curricula, I, I think that's the plural of a curriculum. Uh, is uh, they are constructed so that easy examples show up first and then more difficult examples show up later. Um, you know, you don't, you're not uh, taught multivariate calculus uh, in first grade because that makes no sense. You need to learn addition first. So you, you, the easier stuff comes first and then the more difficult things come later. And so there in curriculum, in curriculum learning, we, there is this extra piece of information that orders the training examples in terms of difficulty, or alternatively, selects examples for that difficulty. So there are variants where training examples are chosen, but for at least this part of the lecture, this part of the class, let's assume that they are sampled randomly. Okay, there is another thing that we cannot expect, which is sometimes we might be just unlucky and might end up not even learning a close approximation of the target function because the training examples are chosen randomly from the distribution. Maybe we got really, really, really unlucky and we got all these rare examples, a training set consisting only of rare examples where all the common things are uh, missing. So if you think of, you know, imagine that you have a, a number line here and you have this Gaussian distribution, Gaussian-like distribution there. Um, and training examples are chosen randomly from that distribution. And uh, this, the vertical axis here represents the probability of seeing a point. Maybe you get points around here a lot, and maybe you get some points here, some points here, and so on. So this might be a representative training example. That dashes that, that there represent points that we might have chosen based on the distribution. So things that are more probable are more frequent. But maybe we just got really, really unlucky today. And instead of getting a training set consisting of probable things, 
we got a training set consisting only of tail events, of tail examples. And we did not see anything from this area. Uh, that anyway, in theory, that is a random sample. It is a random sample that is extremely, extremely improbable. And if that improbable event occurs, there is no hope for us to learn the true function correctly because we only have improbable examples. We have only have examples that look nothing like they look on the test that we might learn a function that is not even a close approximation of the true function. Questions about this? So there are two things that we are giving up. One of them is we don't, we don't expect our learner to learn the true concept exactly. We hope it does, but we don't expect that it always does. And we don't expect that our learner learns even a close approximation to the target concept. Once again, we hope it does, but we are willing to live with the possibility that there might be situations where our data is so bad that we cannot learn even a close approximation. Okay, so this is like a more realistic expectation of what one might expect a learning algorithm to do. The only realistic expectation is that with high probability, we hope to learn a close approximation. With, with high probability, we hope to learn a function that is a close approximation. If that happens, then what we have is a good learning algorithm. If that happens, then what we have is a concept class that's learnable. So a concept class is learnable if with high probability, our learner will find a close approximation of that function. This intuition is going to be the, 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 the driving force behind the definition of the PAC model of learning. So before we kind of uh, formalize this with a bunch of symbols, are there any questions about this or any comments or any thoughts? Do people agree with this? Um, I just want to look around to see if anyone else has a question. Otherwise, I'll go deep. Well, I just thought one thing that helped me visualize the training set versus learning the concept group or the model group. Yeah. I think it was this graph. Because if you could measure training examples from the graph, and then we get a certain constant time by mass. Sure. But if you look at it at home, it would get different. And if you keep doing it for a really long time, and you look at things in motion and stuff like that, you might get things over the Einstein state. Or at least Newton. Yeah. And so, depending on what the data set you use, different things. Yeah. So, I like that example. So, the, let me just repeat it because. Uh, uh, I'm particularly fond of physics examples to illustrate these concepts. Uh, suppose you had to learn the concept of gravity or you had to learn the law of gravitation. Not you, but uh, you already know it. Uh, you had to invent it or discover it. And in order to do that, you dropped a bunch of stuff and measured times and stuff. And you did that here on Earth. And you might come up with a certain law of gravity that says um, your uh, the, the force is proportional to the mass of the thing that you drop and inversely proportional to the square of the distance. There's no notion of the mass of the earth involved because you're doing all your experiments on the earth. Now then you move to Mars and conduct your experiments there and your model no longer works because your model was designed for gravity on earth. If you, this is a, this is a good example of distribution of data points. Your data points were heavily biased by earth points. As a result, you do not get a universal law of gravitation, which does make you wonder how did Newton do what he did, but that's a different question. Uh, there's a question on, on uh, uh, a couple of comments slash questions on uh, Zoom. Is there any approximation of high probability? We will formally quantify the notion of high probability next. So we'll, we'll get to that uh, uh, literally the next thing. Another comment is this sounds like learning over the course of the semester. You learn, aim to learn something over a short period of time and generally get a solid idea of the course. But I would argue you don't know the whole, whole course 100%, but ra rather a close approximation. That's the goal. 
So at the end of the semester, you hope that you get a close approximation. I hope you get a close approximation. But of course, you, neither you nor I know everything there is to know about machine learning. There's always something to learn. So uh, that's what keeps us busy. That's a, that's a useful analogy. Human learning has always been a good sort of a, a analogy to keep in mind in order to motivate machine learning. For me personally, physics has always been a good uh, analogy because I view the exercise of physics, or uh, the, 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 the research agenda of physics as discovering the laws of nature by learning from experiment. We conduct experiment, we entertain hypotheses, and we refine them. And this has been happening over the course of centuries. Uh, I don't know what learning algorithm we are using, but uh, uh, so you know, find metaphors that work for you. But uh, the human learning is a very popular uh, and useful metaphor to kind of uh, co connect these ideas. Okay, so this this uh, this takes us to this idea of probably approximately correctness. Um, this is a fantastic name, and uh, you can kind of break it up into parts. Uh, it starts with this idea that the only realistic expectation of a learner is that we can get a with high probability we can get a close approximation of the uh, target concept in probably approximately correct learning or pack learning. I'm not going to say probably approximately correct again because it's a mouthful. So in pack learning, we are given these two small numbers, epsilon and delta. These are numbers between zero and one, preferably closer to zero. What we hope is with probability, at least one minus delta. So the delta is a number that's very close to zero. One minus delta is a number that's close to one. With probability, at least one minus delta, the learner produces a hypothesis that has an error at most epsilon. So we have the so the, the setup is we have a learner that can produce hypothesis. And for each hypothesis, there is this generalization error. And we hope to produce a, a learner, a, a hypothesis whose generalization error is less than epsilon. For some small epsilon, and if we if that happens, we count learning as success uh, as having succeeded. Now we recognize that even producing a, 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 a classifier, a model with error less than epsilon, can sometimes fail because your data set is uh, bad. So instead of demanding that every single time we get uh, a classifier whose error is less than epsilon, we are happy if with probability one minus delta, we get a classifier whose error is less than epsilon. And if delta and epsilon are really small, then we have a high quality classifier. And the only reason we can hope for this is because it turns out is the this assumption of the distribution being fixed, but uh, uh, possibly unknown, but being fixed across training and generalization. I'm going to formalize this. Uh, uh, with a bit more symbols once again, but uh, this is the, the high level intuition. Any thoughts about this? It does not work. Uh, there's a whole different theory of learning for regression. We're talking about classification. It does not directly work. I mean, you can actually kind of massage the theory. Uh, you have to redefine the notion of an error because we are defining error as being h of x e or uh, act correct as h of x equals f of x. But with regression, we have to soften this, right? So we have to think about how far is it. And so, yes. yes. Ah, so the question is. Are epsilon and delta defined by us, or is that somehow given to uh, Does the learner also produce that? So epsilon and delta are like uh, tolerance parameters. How much accuracy do you want? How much confidence do you want that your learning will succeed? Um, the thing that I want to point out is this is a theoretical concept. We will never end up using epsilon and delta to actually get any bounds on learner performance simply because they will involve other things that we don't have access to, but think of them as our desired tolerance 
of error and uh, the uh, our desired uh, probability of learning succeeding. Yes. So that's a, that's a very interesting question. Um, the question is, do let me try to interpret your question the way I understood it, and um, you can tell me if I got it right. The question was, do epsilon and delta kind of behave inversely with each other? So if epsilon is really really small, if my if my desired accuracy is extremely high, I may have to give up some of this uh, the confidence in learning uh, in my learner succeeding. It turns out there are other factors also that come into play, in particular how much training data you have and what is the size of your hypothesis class. And so we will be looking at uh, at least one theorem before the week is out where all these things kind of interact with each other. And they don't necessarily behave and tag it. Maybe they do. Uh, they, they kind of do move inversely with each other if you keep everything else fixed. And we, you can come back to this question once we see the Occam's razor theorem. Okay, so let me define pack learnability a little bit more formally. Suppose we have a concept class, C, uh, and uh, this concept class is defined over a given instance space um, whose well, instances have uh, are defined by n dimensional features. This is an important uh, complexity parameter that we are going to uh, use later on. We have a learner L that is exploring uh, this concept class using a hypothesis space capital H. Our question, the question that we are interested in is, is this concept class learnable in the pack model by L using H? A lot of symbols, but uh, uh, you know, let's kind of go a little bit uh, baby steps here. We define a concept class, the concept class C, as being pack learnable. This is just a, an expression that I'm defining here. It, uh, it could mean that it does not mean anything. All I'm doing is defining. Uh, the concept class is pack learnable by the algorithm L using the hypothesis space H if for every function in F, uh, F in C, meaning no matter which concept in C was the true concept, and for every distribution over the examples, B, given certain fixed epsilon and delta, and this is a big block, so I'm going to just read it out and then go over it piece by piece. Given M examples sampled independently according to the distribution D, with probability at least one minus delta, the algorithm produces a hypothesis whose error is no more than epsilon. So if you are given M examples and your learning algorithm produces a classifier whose error is bounded on top, so error is no more than epsilon, and it does so no matter which function was the true function, which F was the true function, no matter which distribution over the examples was the fixed distribution over the data, but it does so with high probability. It doesn't do it all the time. It does it with probability at least one minus delta. So more than one minus delta. Now, we call this class to be pack learnable if the number of examples that you need in order to give this guarantee, this guarantee here is polynomial in one minus epsilon, one minus delta n in the size of H. This is a really complicated definition because there are so many moving parts. So let's go over, let's try to interpret this a little bit more uh, colloquially. When I say given M examples and M is polynomial in one minus epsilon, one minus delta N and the size of H, what I mean is given only a small number of examples, given only a polynomial number of examples in the complexity parameter. The complexity parameters of interest here are epsilon, delta, the dimensionality n, and the size of h. Given, uh, so okay, 
one minus epsilon, one minus theta. So given uh, that you have a data set that only some sort of a polynomial that is no more than a polynomial in these terms. So given a small number of examples with high probability, in other words, with probability at least one minus delta, your learner L will produce a good enough classifier. It's not going to produce a perfect, we don't demand that it produces a perfect classifier. All we need is a good enough classifier and by good enough, I mean the error is uh, no more, is at most epsilon. So the, you, the, the classifier is not going to have a generalization error more than epsilon. Uh, just to remind you, by generalization error, I mean the probability that uh, on a randomly chosen example, the hypothesis and the true function disagree. Any thoughts, any questions or comments? I'll let this sink in for 30 seconds. Read it, go over it, and ask me questions. This is a heavy definition, so kind of let it sink in. Yes. For any distribution, irrespective of this is the worst case assumption over distribution. Even if the distribution is the worst distribution over X for whatever worst means, as long as it's fixed between training and test, this applies. Yes. So in all of them, it should be it cannot be more than polynomial in any of them. That's what that means. Yes. Ah, so we are given uh, epsilon and delta. So this we, the, we, we are assuming that we have uh, the epsilon and delta are given to us and this is like your desired uh, tolerance for how good your classifier should be and your desired uh, uh, tolerance for how much you are, how, how willing you are to let learning fail. That's delta. Yes. You say M is polynomial Yeah, but if it's two to the two to the end, then it's no longer polynomial in M. Yes. Other questions? Questions on Zoom? Yes. So, how do we say a epsilon that is zero one one allow them to almost always make this case? Okay. The delta is uh, uh, also in the world, so I need a very low. Success. Yes. But I'm Interesting point. So the question was uh, if by giving you this choice, allowing you to choose epsilon and delta, um, can anything be path learnable? Because it seems like by allowing uh, epsilon, the error to be really, really large. By the way, uh, epsilon more than half, if you have equal data, then let's a reasonable epsilon is not going to be more than half. So let's make it very, very close to half because if it is near one, I can take your classifier and I'll just change the label. If your classifier says zero, I'll predict one. If your classifier says one, I'll predict zero and I get a near perfect classifier. So let's make it close to half. So the, thankfully, this is easy to do by ch changing one of these into a four. Uh, so I have a, my tolerance epsilon is basically uh, very close to chance, which means you could, might, you could just, you know, for the, the learned model is going to just toss a coin. Would that be pack learnable? I would argue, as we will see, that even in those cases, for certain concept classes, the complexity parameter n will mean that uh, learnability, the, the model is not going to be back learnable according to this definition because the 
number of examples needed will be uh, uh, exponential or super exponential in n so it's not going to it's not going to work and also the other thing that i'm talking the, i want you to keep in mind is this this is a theoretical model so we are talking about uh, 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 when i say polynomial in these uh, quantities i'm i mean um, in the functional form right so you know, a polynomial in epsilon might be 1 over epsilon power 100 or something like that so rather than specific numbers I can see you want me to move on. So let's move on. Oh, no, you don't. Yes. Uh, the length instances of length n is uh, just the dimensionality. You can think of it as dimensionality. Uh, I think when this definition was originally written, uh, this was written to be deliberately a little bit more vague. You can encode instances as vectors, uh, as vectors, or you could encode it using some binary encoding. So essentially, think of any how many bits do you need to write down an instance. But for our for our purposes, let's just think dimensionality. For all, for all practical purposes, let's just say dimensionality and move on. Okay, this is just about pack learnability all i have done here i want to restate is define this concept i'm defining a concept class as having this tag of pack learnable if it satisfies these properties it's possible that no concept class has that tag it's possible that all concept classes have the tag in either case that definition becomes trivial it's useless the only way this definition is going to be meaningful is if it allows us to look at some concept class and say some classes are learnable and some are not. So there's, you know, as I since uh, I'm teaching this in class, and since this definition, which came in a 1984 paper, actually was cited for Leslie Valiant's Turing Award, uh, this probably has some more uh, impactful thing than being a trivial definition. But this is not all there is. Imagine that you have a uh, this. this imagine that you have a learner this learner l right imagine that i give you a learner that can satisfy all these problems it can produce a classifier for um, any epsilon for any delta it can produce a classifier whose uh, error is less than epsilon with high probability and it's uh, the the dependence on m is polynomial but that learning algorithm that i have invented is ridiculously slow it is uh, an exponential algorithm. It is so slow that it's going to take forever to run on any reasonable size training data. Would you count that as a success? I wouldn't. And uh, the reason for that is because we still have to implement these algorithms. We still have to run them on data. So the definition of pack learnability is really a two-sided definition. There's another extension of this called efficient learnability. Uh, concept class is efficiently learnable if all of this is true and the, the, the time that is taken for the learner to produce a hypothesis that satisfies these properties, the time is polynomial in the same complexity parameter. So we want for efficient learnability, we want a, class, a learning algorithm that can produce a model, a classifier efficiently, in other words, in polynomial time that has uh, low error and it can do that with high probability. What I've done here is uh, imp I've imposed two kinds of limitations. The first one is called sample complexity. Sample complexity is this information theoretic idea, uh, which says, is there enough information inside a sample, a training set of size M, so that I can disentangle whether this particular hypothesis or that particular hypothesis is better. Is there, does my, does my training data contain enough information? Sample complexity is an idea that you might encounter only in a machine learning class because it's inherently something that is, um, uh, that's like a learnability uh, type thing. Is the, is, the, is the sample that you are given sufficient? 
There's also another requirement, which is polynomial time complexity, which is the computational complexity that you stand, you typically encounter, say, in an algorithm class. Is there an efficient algorithm that can take my data set and produce a good hypothesis? So for path learnability, we need both of these things. Um, but sometimes, you know, just for this, so that we have some terminology, the first part is called path learnable. The second part is called efficiently path learnable. Um, and the other, uh, so I, I just realized that uh, I did not explain something very clearly before. What we also want is for this particular definition to hold, we need the hypothesis to have, uh, we need to be able to get to a small error for any epsilon, not the fixed epsilon. So we want our hypothesis to get an arbitrarily small error for any function in the concept class. Uh, we'll assume that the hypothesis, the, the, if this is your con uh, concept class C, which means nature can pick some function inside this, your learner is exploring the set of functions that at least contains the concept class. So H contains the concept class. If H is equal to C, then we are it's just as a matter of terminology, it's called properly pack learnable. Uh, if H is bigger than C, it's just pack learnable. Uh, and both of these are uh, interesting things. Importantly, this is a worst case definition. It must meet this accuracy uh, threshold for any epsilon, no matter what the distribution of the data is. So it doesn't matter. Uh, uh, what the fixed but unknown distribution is, your learning algorithm should succeed with high probability. Uh, this is sometimes called the distribution free assumption. And it should also work no matter what the true function is. The true function could be any of the functions in the concept class, and your learning algorithm should still find a good enough approximation. Only if those happen, you call it uh, pack learning. Questions? Questions about uh, the definition of pack learnability and anything that we've seen today? Yes. Can you speak up, please? Uh, the last one, which you were saying, uh, any, any arbitrary scholar would which means before we try it now, one by epsilon. Yes. Yes. Yes, that's right. If you demand that your error is, if you demand that your error is, should be very, very low, a polynomial in one over epsilon means that your sample complexity, M, M is also called the sample complexity. The sample complexity is, might be really large. That makes sense, right? If you want a classifier that is incredibly accurate, you might be willing to pay in the form of more data. If you are okay with a classifier that's really not that accurate, maybe you can live with, uh, you, can, you can get away with less data. The number of examples that is uh, needed for successful training is sometimes called the sample complexity. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Will you? We haven't yet touched upon boosting, so we'll come to that only after spring break. Uh, let's come back to that question. We'll come back to the question after spring break. It's a, it's an interesting question. It was an interesting series of papers in the late eighties that asked the question and then answered it. And the answer to that question actually. The people who answered the question got a Goodell Prize for that answer, and it's a fun discussion. But uh, I don't want to take that detour right now. We will get there most likely the week after spring break, or the week after that week. We have about twenty minutes left, and what I'd like to do is. Uh, Take this uh, definition and this idea of pack learnability and make it a little bit more actionable. And in the world of theory, actionable means proving a theorem. It's action such as it is. So we're going to prove a theorem called Occam's razor. 
Just to kind of step back and see where we are, we've defined this notion of SAC learnability. And now we are going to start applying it. Our first application is a sub point of this, uh, this same section. And we're going to look at something called uh, Occam's razor. We've already defined the formal model of SAC learnability. And our goal is now to uh, explore connections to Occam's razor. Occam's razor is uh, named after this person, uh, William of Occam, who is supposed to have said that thing in Latin, um, which just means don't, uh, don't make complex explanations unless you need to. Prefer simpler explanation over complex one unless you really need to. I mean, he didn't use words like uh, explanations and uh, unless, but uh, it was all Latin. Um, it was literally all Latin. Uh, it, but this idea of preferring uh, simplicity uh, when we try to explain things is, is, you know, it's named after William of Ockham, but it exists in philosophical traditions around the world. And uh, it's, it's this natural sort of a bias. It's this bias that says, if you have an observation and you explain it, you have two competing explanations. There's a natural bias to choose a simpler one. If you see that uh, you get out of your house one morning and you find that the grass is wet, you can probably explain it as, you know, maybe there was rain or maybe the sprinkler came on. You're not going to assume that the neighbor across the road brought the hose pipe and kind of poured water over your lawn because that's a more complicated explanation. So unless there's evidence, you're not going, you should not prefer a complicated explanation. But on the other hand, Nothing in the data says that was not the right answer. So there's a there's a natural sort of a tendency for us to prefer simpler explanation. And that we, what we're going to do now is to prove a theorem that in some sense behaves like Occam's razor uh, for learning algorithms. To get started, let's consider this uh, situation where we have a learner that produces a hypothesis that's consistent with the training set. We have a learning algorithm that no matter which training data you get, your classifier will get zero error on the training data. It'll, it'll produce a classifier that gets zero error on the training data. Can you tell me some examples of such learning algorithms? Yes. A decision tree learner. The ID3 algorithm does that. The ID3 algorithm is a consistent learner. It will always give you a classifier that gets zero error as long as the data does not have any inconsistencies in itself. Another consistent learner, which is far less interesting, is a learner that takes all your data and puts it in a table. And when a new example comes in, it just looks up and returns the table. It's going to get perfect accuracy on the training data. It's going to be exactly at chance on any future example. So suppose we have a learner that produces a hypothesis that's consistent. But it turns out that the training set that you have, you just got unlucky. And the training set that you have is not representative of the instance space itself. Then in that case, the hypothesis that you learned, the tree that you learned, for example, could be bad, even though it's consistent with the entire training set, right? So your training set might have a hundred million examples. Your decision tree learner gets you a tree that gets zero accuracy on 100 million examples. And these 100 million examples were literally, suppose, all edge cases that never occur in real, in real life. Then when you actually take your tree and apply it on any real data, well, who knows how well it works, right? So your learned hypothesis could be arbitrarily bad. What the, the, the motivation for what we're going to do next is we can try to quantify when such bad situations will happen, and then ask, what should I do? What will it take for this bad situation to be a low probability event? We're going to uh, basically just try to do that bound, and out of that will will come out a theorem that satisfies that allow, that gives us the tools for checking whether some concept class is fact learnable or not. And that theorem will be is, is an Occam's razor theorem. Is the setup clear? I saw two heads nodding very vigorously, so I'm very happy about that. 
other not so much um, any questions about this setup any questions on zoom if not let's uh, dive into the uh, the formalization I'm going to prove a claim that says that the probability there is some hypothesis H that is consistent with M training example and yet has an error more than epsilon. The probability that that happens is less than the size of H times one minus one minus epsilon over M. What these two points together mean that the first point is just, oh, by the way, this is assuming that uh, this is a version of Occam's razor that assumes consistency. There are other versions of Occam's razor that we will drop that assumption, where we drop that assumption. And for now, let's assume consistency. So the assumptions here are that we have a hypothesis that maybe our learning algorithm produced, or maybe we just are entertaining right now. That hypothesis is consistent with the M training example, and yet bad because it has a high training error or a high generalization error. This is error D. So it's consistent with your training data. So it has low training error, zero training error, and yet has high training error. This is a bad situation because our, our training data can, our learning algorithm can be fooled by this training data into thinking this is a good classifier because it gets zero error. The claim is that such a situation has a probability uh, of uh, the, the probability that such a situation happens is going to be less than the size of the hypothesis times one minus epsilon power m. And uh, let's uh, this is a rather simple proof, so let's just work through it. Let's say that we have one such bad hypothesis h. The error of h is more than epsilon. Recall that error is simply the probability that f of x and h of x are not agreeing with each other. That means that the error d of h is more than epsilon. In other words, probability of f of x not equal to h of x is more than epsilon. I let's use the same epsilon. Okay. Or what's the probability that it's not equal? It's exactly the same as one minus the probability that they are equal. And now I can move the probability term to the other side. Literally, it turns out. And say that probability of f of x equals h of x is less than. Did I get this right? Yes. It's less than one minus epsilon. What this is saying is the probability the we have this hypothesis whose error is more than epsilon. That means the probability that it's going to agree with the true label is going to be less than one minus epsilon. This is not like some very complicated thing. I've just uh, moved terms around. Now, rather than me, rather than worrying about my writing, you can just look at a printed version of that. So the probability that h of x is consistent with one example is less than one minus epsilon. So even though we have a bad classifier whose error is more than epsilon, or the, we have a bad classifier whose error is more than epsilon, whose error is more than epsilon, is exactly the same as saying the probability that your classifier is going to be correct is less than one minus epsilon. Correct on what? Correct on one randomly chosen example. Remember, our training set was not one randomly chosen example, but M randomly chosen example. So each example is chosen independently. So we could ask, what's the probability that your H of X agrees with the true function on all of them? If because each one is chosen independently, the probability that H is consistent with M example is less than one minus epsilon power M because you're multiplying one minus epsilon M times. 
because they are all independent from each other. So probability that h of x is consistent with m examples is less than 1 minus epsilon over x. Now this is for one particular classifier. Some classifier, we don't know which one that uh, uh, our learner is going to pick. The statement that we are interested in is the probability that there is some bad hypothesis, not just one. The probability, this is asking, what we have here is the probability that we have one particular bad hypothesis uh, being consistent with M examples. The probability that some bad uh, uh, hypothesis is consistent with M examples can be obtained using what's called the union bound. You may have seen the union bound in some class before. Have people seen the union bound? There is one thumbs up and silence all around. I suspect you have not, or if you have, you, I suspect you have, but it was not presented to you with that name. Um, it's simply a very, it's a very uh, uh, simple idea. If you have two events, let's say, you have two events, A and B, probability of A or B is what? I, I, Okay, you can write this as is what uh, it's going to be what can someone in terms of a in terms of uh, a probability of b and a and b yeah so it, oh what did I do here it's probability of a plus probability of b minus probability of a and b right this quantity here is negative, which means probability of A or B is, what can you say in terms of what goes here, greater or less? Because of less than. The probability of A or B, because you're taking away and you're, there, there is this, I'm, re, I'm removing this negative term. Okay. This is just, an, uh, I can generalize this, it turns out, probability of A or B or C is less than probability of A plus probability of B plus probability of C. Or in general, probability of at least one of a one a two a n is less than this is the union bound it's a very boring bound um, because it's kind of trivial the probability of at least one of a collection of random variables being true is simply is less than the sum of them independently being true Sure. Yes. Yes. And yes. So we can apply the union bound to the previous case. What we had here is the probability that one hypothesis is consistent with M examples and is bad is less than this quantity. The probability that at least one of them is consistent with M examples and is bad is the sum of 1 minus epsilon power m, how many times? As many as the number of hypotheses you have, which is simply the size of the hypothesis space times 1 minus epsilon power m. Comments, questions? This is a kind of an argument that we'll be sort of making a few times in this class. So, you know, it's good to get the, the, the union bound is a very useful tool. It is, it's a very, very loose upper bound because you're dropping a whole bunch of probability terms in order to uh, get to that. But it's very convenient because it's, you can just do these kinds of tricks. So we'll, uh, the union bound shows up quite a lot in uh, uh, this, this sort of, this 
part of the uh, uh, CS theory world. Any comments or questions? Usually at this point, I've noticed there are two kinds of people, people who have given up and don't really want to ask questions or people who got it and don't really want to ask questions. If you are in the former category, please ask questions because if you have a question, I guarantee at least 10 more people have one. So you'll be helping the others in your class as well. Yes. This is nothing. There's no such thing. This is the entirety of what we are considering is here. If any number of examples. We have, we are, we, this is essentially starting with a clean slate and saying that if this happens, that a hypothesis is consistent with an example and has a generalization error more than epsilon, that event is going to is going to be less probable than if the probability of that event is going to be less than size of h times one minus epsilon power m. Yeah. I think my only question is I don't really understand how big or small that that is. Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> no, so the, this number. So it's entirely possible that this number, size of h times one minus epsilon power m, might be a hundred. Or a million, but that's a million. If it's anything more than one, it makes no sense because the probability is less than one, less than or equal to one. I'll give you an example of one way to think about how how to kind of think how to think about the size of this value. Suppose you have, uh, let's say, epsilon is say zero point one. Okay. Oh yeah. Let's say epsilon is zero point one. That means one minus epsilon is 0 0.9. One minus epsilon square is 0 0.81. Power three is 0 0.729. It just keeps going down. Now, one minus epsilon power 1000. Imagine M, by the way, M is the size of the training set. So 1000 examples is not unheard of. So one minus epsilon power one thousand, I think, might be something like ten power minus forty. I'm just making that up, but it might be that. And let's say your concept class is uh, uh, something that we've already seen, say uh, conjunctions in n dimensions. So you have the number of uh, conjunctions in n dimensions is how many? The number of uh, conjunctions in n dimensions. It's two power n. So size of h, say, is 2 power n, then I can have 2 power n times 10 power minus 40. For even, uh, you know, if you have 40 conjunctions, this quantity, or even not just 40, if you have up to 120 dimensions, this quantity is going to be less than 1. So if you have uh, 100 functions that your hypothesis class is searching over, then this quantity is going to be really, really tiny. So the, the interesting part here is if you multiply, it, it really boils down to if you multiply numbers between 0 and 1, many, many, many times, you get really tiny numbers very quickly. Other thoughts? About, yes. Oh, that's that's such a great question. The question is, with perceptron, isn't the hypothesis space infinite? That is such a good question. Uh, which means that this thing is a meaningless bound because we have infinite times any number is going to be infinite. So the probability being less than infinite is vacuous. Well, it turns out we have made another assumption here, which I did not put anywhere on the slide, but I kind of let it slip, which is we're working with finite hypothesis spaces. When we get to uh, infinite hypothesis spaces, like for the linear classifiers, this kind of a theory no longer holds directly. Instead, we have to invent a new, new, uh, new uh, idea called the VC dimension, which behaves like the size of the hypothesis space, actually log of the size of the hypothesis space, and 
uh, th that's like a separate lecture of its own. But uh, we will have to get to that uh, uh, after the break. All right, I'm going to stop here. Uh, in the next uh, lecture on Thursday, I will take this exact claim and then talk about how we can now introduce the idea of delta, whether how well, well, you know the success of learning into this thing and introduce bring this bound that is called the Occam's razor theorem. Um, don't forget your homework. Get started soon. I have office hours at two o'clock. If you have any questions, feel free to come in.